What if you were owned by someone? What if you were treated as a thing to be bought and sold? During the Enlightenment, people started realizing that all men were created equal and should be treated as such. The idea might have existed in earlier times, but it was a bourgeoisie sentiment relegated to the upper echelons of societies where it did not serve any purpose. Ironically, slavery was still well and alive. Some might say it had morphed into its most horrific, brutal, and exploitative form. History is often filled with mesmerizing stories, great feats, and accomplishments, but there is also a dark side to our past, one that should be confronted even if it is painful. One such gloomy aspect of our history is the story of the Atlantic slave trade. As with many historical themes, slavery is generally often oversimplified and misrepresented. Before tackling the specifics of the Atlantic slave trade, it is important to understand slavery in its more universal form. The roots of slavery run deep since it is present throughout the written history of humanity. Evidence for it can be found in Egyptian wall paintings, the Babylonian Code of Hammurabi, the oldest code of law from the 18th century BCE, and even the Bible. Though it is impossible to pinpoint when the first slave was captured, it is presumed that it did not happen before the Neolithic Agricultural Revolution. This momentous transformation happened around 10,000 BCE as humans began their conversion from hunter-gatherer to sedentary agricultural societies. This would have allowed for a necessary food surplus for maintaining a slave workforce. Nonetheless, some scholars point out that some later hunter-gatherer societies, like the atypical resource-abundant Pacific Northwest Native American tribes, also held slaves. Thus, slavery may be older than agriculture. Regardless, the practice certainly became more widespread as early civilizations developed. When talking about the transatlantic slave trade, people tend to focus on the later periods when the British and French dominated the market of forced human labor. However, the roots of this issue began in the early days of European exploration, predating the so-called discovery of the Americas. The Portuguese, the first Europeans since ancient times to explore the African coast and the Atlantic Ocean, were the ones who started it, and the Spanish quickly followed. The story of the transatlantic slave trade begins in the early 15th century with the Age of Discovery, when the Europeans realized there was more to the world than their own continent. By the early 1440s, the first large number of slaves were brought to Europe by the Portuguese. According to sources, there were 235 prisoners of war, and one-fifth of them were presented to the royal family of Portugal. By 1444, Henry the Navigator began selling enslaved people from sub-Saharan Africa. However, it wasn't long before the Portuguese abandoned slave hunting raids, as they proved to be too costly and inefficient. Instead, around 1448, they switched to trade, mimicking the already existing slave market in Africa. With that, the Portuguese simply tapped into the already existing trade network that had been created long before by the Muslim and local African merchants. The number of enslaved people transported back to Europe was relatively small. It is estimated that the Portuguese annually brought about 1,000 enslaved people to Europe after 1448, rising to roughly 2,000 by the end of the century. It constituted about one-third of the total humans traded by the European merchants. In contrast, around two-thirds of enslaved people were traded back to the Africans for gold. According to a conservative estimate from modern scholars, by the end of the 16th century, the Portuguese trafficked slightly more than 240,000 African slaves. A small percentage, just below 25,000, went to Europe, and around 18,000 were shipped to the Atlantic Islands. The late 16th century saw a minor change in the trade of enslaved Africans. This transformation started in 1580, when Portugal and Spain were united through a personal union, as there was a single king for both nations. This allowed for easier commerce between the Spanish and the Portuguese, but it also opened up the latter to confrontations with the Dutch. The Dutch were fighting the Spanish for their independence and were growing a strong navy, which they used against Portuguese ships and possessions after the Union. This was in addition to the intrusion of both the British and the French, who began establishing their presence on the African coast and in the Americas. This slowly led to the Portuguese slave trade monopoly breaking up, as both nations wanted a piece of the profit. The growth of enslaved people, as well as the rising volume of the slave trade in French colonies throughout the late 17th and early 18th centuries, 
prompted the government of Paris to legally regulate this aspect of colonial life. However, these laws were not aimed at improving a slave's life, despite having articles pertaining to the issue. Their sole goal was to legally control the slave trade and, through it, secure both sugar production and French sovereignty over the colonies. From 1783 to 1793, the French slave traders brought an average of almost 30,000 enslaved annually. However, this expansion did not last long, as the ideas of enlightenment gave birth to the French Revolution in the late 18th century people had begun opening their eyes to the evils of slavery. On the other hand, the growth of England's colonial domain only expanded the demand for enslaved labor. This gave an increased incentive to the traders to challenge the Dutch, their primary suppliers in that field. Overall, during the 17th century, modern estimates claim the volume of the English slave trade to be about 330,000 people. Most of these, about 300,000, came in the second half of the century. The sharpest increase came after 1680, as the last two decades of the century saw about 50% of the overall English slave trade. England went from not being involved in the slave trade to barely falling short of the Portuguese involvement in about one century. However, it was merely the beginning. While their neighbors, the French, were fighting for equality and higher social ideals in the 18th century, the English dominated the transatlantic slave trade. It is often thought that the first slaves brought to the New World was in 1619. However, slavery had likely been present since the 1500s. Regardless of when it first started, the British slave market was growing because their colonies, including the 13 colonies that would later revolt to form the U.S., needed an ever-increasing number of slaves to sustain their growing production. After the American Revolutionary War, when the British lost control of the 13 colonies, the slave trade continued. In the entire 18th century, including before and after the Revolutionary War, between 6 to 7 million slaves were brought over to the Americas. Children of slaves became the property of the slave owners, and they could be traded or sold, making them a huge profit with very little cost. This further denied Africa the population and people it needed, setting the continent back even further. The ravages of slavers harmed an entire continent as communities were decimated due to European trade. The enslaved Africans were brought across the Atlantic under some of the worst conditions. Once captured, the enslaved people began the first part of their journey. Most of them were imprisoned or captured in the inner lands, so the local slave merchants, often part of the same nobility that led the wars, transported them toward the coast. This part of the experience varied a lot. Some were carried on large canoes and boats down major rivers, like the Congo or Senegal. Others were transported via land caravans, maybe on foot or some kind of cart. Therefore, the length of this voyage varied depending on the local geography, place of capture, and existing trade practices. Furthermore, depending on local bureaucracies and customs, slaves might have had to wait for the European traders to finalize their deal, pay their tribute, and get the clearance to board the slaves on their ships. It is also possible that in some cases, the Europeans had to wait for their African partners to gather enough enslaved humans to fill their ships, as it was important to maximize their gain. Once again, the treatment of the enslaved people while they waited depended on local conditions, with the most notable being political and ecological stability. The waiting period was relatively tolerable if there was no major wars, political upheavals, or droughts. Nevertheless, it is certain that the enslaved people suffered while they waited. Any favorable treatment was more an exception than the rule, and many captives had no clue what would happen to them in the immediate future. Overall, modern scholars estimate that, on average, an enslaved person waited between 6 to 12 months before being loaded on a ship. During this time, which includes being transported to the coast, many slaves perished, whether from starvation, disease, or the maltreatment and cruelty of their captors. Upon reaching North or South America, the slaves were sold at auction. The Europeans would fill their ships with crops and goods before returning home. After the American Revolutionary War, things changed a little bit. Before the war, the northern colonies had become home to vocal abolitionists, although many condoned slavery. Still, it caused understandable hesitation on the part of the southern colonies, where slavery was a prevalent practice. However, the New England colonies knew that the probability of victory would significantly decrease if the southern colonies would not join them in the struggle. Compromising their beliefs against slavery 
they opted to ensure that slavery would be built into the new country's doctrines. Some slaves in the South thought that the British were more likely to hand them their freedom than the Americans. In the chaos, most of them ran away from their owners. Others chose to fight for the British. According to modern estimates, more than 20,000 runaway slaves joined the British Army. Modern scholars estimate that about 12.5 million enslaved Africans have been sent to the New World by the Civil War. Notably, these numbers vary, going from as low as 9.5 million to as high as 17 million. The end of the slave trade prompted several crucial changes, most notably the abolition of slavery. Like many societies that argued against the transatlantic slave trade had predicted, ending the trade of humans allowed for the gradual end of institutionalized slavery. Haiti was the first to ban it, followed closely by many of the newly independent Latin American nations, which were previously colonies. Britain banned it in 1833, France abolished it in 1848, the U.S. in 1865, and the Portuguese colonies in 1869. Many others did the same, with Brazil being the last major Atlantic slave trading and slave owning nation to ban it in 1888. By then, abolition had become detached from the transatlantic slave trade as it expanded to encompass the whole world. It became an issue that almost all nations found common ground on. Since then, almost every country worldwide has abolished slavery and, with it, the slave trade. Almost no one still publicly argues for it since it is generally condemned as vile and inhuman. Still, it continues to exist in some remote parts of the world. As far as the transatlantic slave trade is concerned, it may be gone, but its cultural and political remnants persist. To learn more about the horrors of the transatlantic slave trade, check out our book, The Transatlantic Slave Trade, a captivating guide to the Atlantic slave trade and stories of the slaves that were brought to the Americas. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free mythology bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.